Thank you, Father. Father, we just come before you on this Shabbat. Thank you, Father, for your pure work forth, Lord. Nothing but your pure Torah, Father. We ask God that God, with the Holy Spirit, Lord, lead us and guide us into all truth. And we just give you all the glory and all the praises. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your son and for the blood covering. And we just ask, Lord God, for you to be glorified, that you would draw all men to you and that many would stumble across this teaching, Lord, and their eyes would be open in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, you know, we finished the book of uh, Shemot, which is, of course, Exodus last week. And, uh, you know, when you finish any, any one of the books in the Hebrew scriptures, it says, Katsak, Katsak, Benik, Katsek. Be strong, be strong, be strengthened in the word. And Amen. the word strengthens us. The word, the spirit who wrote the word strengthens us in, in our faith. And it's of imperative. Uh, it's totally imperative in these last days because gross, gross deception, gross darkness is surely covering the earth according to Isaiah 60. And the gross darkness can only make headway when the truth and the bright lights are not seen. When the truth of Messiah in his eternal word is not seen or heard and the gospel of the Messiah is not preached in its fullness, then we are going to have a lot of darkness and tremendous deception. And, and you know, hell would not have to enlarge itself at all uh, if, if there wasn't deception. The father of lies is the father of deception. And yeah. so starting this new book, uh, Leviticus is Vayikra, and it means, and he called. Uh, the last Torah portion of the book of Exodus ended with uh, the Messiah, the God of Israel dwelling in his tabernacle, and he descended down into it. Um, and now he is giving Moses Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, instruction of how the children of Israel are, are to draw near to him through sanctified offerings. They're called korban. Korban means to draw near. Kor korbanot is the plural of that with offerings. What's really interesting, you know, in, in an eternal Torah school, in an eternal Torah scroll, there is regular size letters. Some are large and some are small. And so when they're extra large or extra small, uh, the God of Israel is making a huge statement. And in this particular portion, when the Lord calls to Moses, Moses was uh, written about by God as the most humble man on the face of the earth. Can you imagine the almighty calling you the most humble man? Well, God did call him that. And he didn't feel worthy that God should call to him, even though God had called to him two times before. He had been on Mount Sinai. He had received the eternal covenants. He was uh, the, the man of God. He was the one that, that saw God and, and, and heard him speak face to face. But he wanted the scroll to actually say, and God met with me instead of God calling to me. So it, when you look at an eternal Torah scroll, it will actually have an extra small Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the eternal Hebrew language. And it also is the master letter of all 22. It speaks of who God is, but Moses was so humble, he did not want to even in any way, shape, or form, really be paralleled in any way with the Almighty. So he put a very small olive. Isn't that interesting that, that our teacher Moses did that? And so, you know, you think about uh, when the Almighty uh, in the scripture, when he calls to people, you will see, of course, in the scripture when he, he said, Moses, Moses, a cry, and then he said, uh, Samuel, Samuel. You know, and of course, we know the story of Samuel and David, David. And then, of course, Rabbi Paul, uh, Rob Shaul, who we call the Apostle Paul. 
from the heavens in the eternal Hebrew tongue. Remember, Rabbi Paul was a linguist. He knew Latin. He knew Greek. He knew Hebrew. He knew many languages, but he had to speak in the eternal Hebrew because that gives a perfect definitive understanding and meaning definition of who God is in his word. So he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. He says, why are you persecuting me when uh, Shaul was killing all of the, the first century Christians? And so the question is, does the Almighty ever call your name? And do you really want him to call your name? Do you really want to hear what he has to say? Are you open to his rebuke? Uh, that is a big question uh, in the end times, because uh, in many ways, we might want to skirt around certain things. We're just hoping that God really doesn't pay attention to all of our thoughts and words and deeds. And he's kind of overlooked this, overlooked that. But he has to rebuke us. He has to chastise us. He has to set us on the straight course because we're the sons and daughters of the father. We're the bride of Yeshua. So we want to hear his voice. We want to be in that category. And so Yeshua, in all of these offerings we're going to talk about in this initial Torah portion of Leviticus, it really does speak of the Almighty and the perfection of the Almighty, but it has great application to Yeshua and his bride, who we are. And Yeshua wants us to draw near to him and his father. And he understands it's one thing to be ransomed by the blood of the lamb. It's one thing to have our name in the lamb's book of life. It's another thing to walk in cleanliness, to walk in holiness, to walk in communion. That's a whole nother thing because God cannot, uh, uh, he, he cannot countenance sin. He makes that very clear, uh, clear throughout his scripture. So atonement and holiness truthfully are two separate issues the blood of the messiah cleanses us and forgives us but our lifestyle in god in the almighty in the word would have to necessitate obedience which would lend us to walk in communion and communion would be to shema to listen and obey shema means to hear and to simultaneously obey. And so there are five different offerings in the first a parashat Torah portion of Leviticus, and each totally symbolizes uh, the different sins, transgressions they're, they're, uh, of, that a person can make, but equally they are glimpses of the Messiah and his bride. And we know that Messiah, uh, was, is, and forevermore shall be the total selfless one. And Rabbi Paul says in Corinthians 11, he says, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. So to imitate the Messiah like Rabbi Paul would be obviously to want to hear his voice and like Rabbi Paul to imitate him. So the different uh, sacrifices, which there are five, are for our restoration back to him. And so to, to really walk with him. And so uh, let's say that you, you are from a family of alcoholics and drunkards and things of this nature. Well, you might want not, and you personally have that issue, you might not want to drink or say you're from a family of sexual perversion, where you would need to be very careful about your eye contact and and where, and the, your body and not going to certain movies, or say you're from a family that never sanctified the name of the Almighty and would say curse words and blasphemous things. Well, obviously you would watch your speech and you would watch your hearing of songs and movies, things like this. The word itself, you know, the Torah, whenever I say the word Torah, I am always speaking of all the word. I'm not talking about just succinctly the first five books, because again, people always will say Torah is law, law, law. I'm not under the law. That's not what it's referring to. Torah is pure holiness, pure righteousness, and perfect instruction. And so naturally, the do's and the don'ts of the word, that there's going to be don'ts because we were born into sin. We have proclivity to sin. We are always having an inclination to do wrong. And so the Torah word, any part of it, 
uh, will always bring us back into a right relationship with God. And so the deep, deep levels of the eternal Torah word, we call them the Sud level. And we are not talking about Kabbalah. We're not talking about mysticism. We're not talking about crystal balls. We are not referring to strange, aberrant uh, numerology, things of this nature. Remember everything that the Almighty created at Hasatan, Satan, the adversary, always has an imitation. He always has something that looks close to it, but he can't create anything, so he has to mimic. So this is your mission. If you choose to accept it, is to figure out what is pure truth, what is pure truth, and what is half truth and half a lie. Because according to the book of, he, of Peter, that if something is half, half a lie, it's no truth at all. So we must be very, very, very careful to all the voices that we listen to that hopefully, seemingly stand behind the Bema and represent the Almighty. That it's not a sound bite, that it's not a five minute sermonette on this or that. It has to be the whole of scripture. I went over this last week. No, this is 1 Peter 1.20. It might be Second Peter 120, uh, that no scripture is of any private interpretation. It can't have an idiotic separate application by itself. It has to be married to the whole of scripture. Very, very important that you understand that. All sacrifices were means of atonement to draw near. They were all vicarious substitutes that the offerer brought. Now, a vicarious substitute would be something that uh, someone else is taking your place. And so when they would come to the temple what, before it was destroyed and offered to the high priest, they would bring the offering, not lame. You, I'm sure most of you have read the book of Malachi, where God says, I'm a great king. How dare you bring me a blemished, a lame, uh, a handicapped, in some way scabbed animal. I'm a great king. So based on the animal that you were able to bring, being in good shape, being acceptable, good and perfect, according to Rabbi Paul in Romans 12, it was representing you. It had to take your place in the sins that you have committed. And so, you, you know, it, when you lay, the offer would lay his hand, excuse me, his hand on the head of the animal as that vicarious substitute that would necessitate that animal was now becoming the ransom in hebrew the word is pada it is your ransom in the renewed covenant it says come boldly before the throne room of grace that you might find mercy in your time of need that doesn't mean you run into the place where the ark of the covenant is it means it actually means that you stand outside most respectfully by the blood of the lamb because your name is in the lamb's book of life and you get entrance that way just like the book of esther the scepter had the king had to extend the scepter to her before she could enter well how true is that and so the first offering um, is the Ola, O-L-A-H, if you want to just spell it in English. And it's a voluntary offering, voluntary. And it represents the person uh, desiring for purification of their flesh, of all uncleanness, of all their thoughts, their words, their deeds. It's a total abandonment uh, to, to be clean again interesting uh it's it's like you're so thankful you're so amazed at the holiness of god kind of like the the woman who broke the alabaster box which was a year's wages that was and and with her hair you know uh, wiped the, her tears from his feet that there are certain things that we posture ourselves for in our relationship with the lord which is a deed, an actual deed, not just a word. Word can just be nice and fluffy and I love you and I appreciate you, but the, but the deeds, when it comes down to the deeds, that's where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so in the same way, a total abandonment, a total wanting to be purified, not holding on to any, any sin of any sort. First Peter, I want to... Um, I've got my King James Bible right here. 
and I want to read something in First Peter here. There's a scripture that speaks to this. It says, who verily, but you have been, you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your empty manner of life received by tradition from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah as a lamb without blemish, without any spot, who truthfully was ordained before the foundation of the world, but now is manifest in these last times for you. And so as, as a Ola offering to the Lord, that really, if you think about it, um, let's talk about this because let's go back to Romans 12 because we're speaking of the, the Apostle Paul. And he says, I beseech you, uh, dear Mishpoka, family of God, by the mercies of God, you present. Now, remember, he's looking. He was a Torah scholar. So everything that Rabbi Paul wrote in his epistles have to be, have to be substantiated by the eternal Torah. There can be no incongruency with one word that he said. So he was looking back to the, to the first five chapters of, of Leviticus when he said this, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service that you are not transformed, conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, you may demonstrate in your life what is the acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. Now, there he's saying, as, as, a, as a believer, that being on the altar of sacrifice, he's saying that you would be acceptable, good, and perfect, just as the animals had to be for the high priest to receive them. And so do not be deceived that because you are ransomed, uh, that, um, that God will ever wink at your sin, or that everybody is in one big you know, um, uh, pool in heaven all together. No, that, that can't be right because God, it says that he, he numbers every hair on our head. He knows every thoughts. So it, I'm hard pressed to believe. And, and I'm not saying this in particular, um, for any reason, because it's not exactly concrete, but I will say that all scripture alludes to this fact. Yeshua says, behold, I come quickly. And I will reward every man and wo woman according to their works that they shall be. Not the warm, fuzzy words, but according to the works that they do. So that would mean that martyrs and those who have died as martyrs, that they say, like Yeshua, I came to do thy will, O God, uh, because I have loved righteousness in great congregation. So it, martyrs, people of that uh, a vesture, I, we would have to say, um, would be, you know, maybe dwelling in more of, of light in the eternal kingdom of God in heaven. And of course, we know that Revelation 22 very clearly says that not all will go through the city, not all will eat of the leaves of the tree of life. It, so there is different mm, celestial realms. I like to use that instead of compartments, but we can use whatever okay. terminology. Okay. It just is saying, every, everybody please mute themselves while I'm talking. Make sure you mute yourself. Uh, that that in, in reality, our life and our decisions without question will place us in his eternal kingdom. Whether you believe in the rapture, whether you believe he's just second coming back, whether you believe we go up to heaven for seven years, whether you believe that we just enter into the kingdom after the tribulation, however you slice the pie, all of it is the kingdom of heaven. All of it is the kingdom of God. Whether we're up there, whether we're down here, we all, we also know after the millennium that there is no more temple and, and the light of God and the lamb is the light thereof, the shekinah of God. But whatever your 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 strong persuasion is, is that you, based on you saying, I came to do thy will, teach me to do thy will, I delight to do thy will, those statements that are genuine will definitely place you in certain celestial realms. That is just the plain, plain scripture. And so Paul, Rabbi Paul, would have been thinking of the Ola offering when he wrote uh, Romans 12 
about being this uh, on the altar. He is saying, presenting your a living sacrifice. Well, guess what? The animals were living sacrifices, the vicarious atonement for you. So it's all the same understanding. And remember, Rabbi Paul, uh, after the, the Lord called his name twice, he had to go three years into Saudi Arabia. He had to divest himself of all that was not pure Torah so that he could be an emissary of absolute truth. Remember in Yeshua, now think about this, all the words of read in the gospels of our Yeshua, our perfect eternal son, when he spoke the high priestly prayer and they said, what, what is truth? Thy Torah is truth. He was saying that as the ultimate high priest. He was going to be resurrected. He was going to give his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his kingship, his priesthood as Melchizedek. He is saying as that as the soon to be eternal high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for us, thy Torah is truth. And so the Ola, the complete abandonment, was the only sacrifice that was completely consumed on the fire of the five, the voluntary, because that's somebody that represents wanting to be in full communion with God. And so you think about uh, when you go to a funeral, you see a dead man in a casket right? Well, a dead man says nothing. He has no will of his own. It's all over. He's in the eternal realm. It's simple as that. And so the father would have us as his people to really be like dead people, no will of our own. And so that is very, very, very powerful Ola offering. The second one is called the grain offering. This is not an animal, but the grain offering always had to be unleavened, matzah offered as a glorious aroma on the fire and the remainder of this offering was shared with the high priest now this is interesting this offering consisted of unleavened now god makes this statement over and over no leaven no leaven why no leaven leaven always represents corruption deceit avarice self-will self-absorption uh preservation of your life all of this stuff is leaven. It has nothing to do with our Messiah. And so the unleavened matzah and the olive oil, you had to have pure olive oil, just like the olive tree representing Israel. You cannot have, you cannot have anything that's not pure olive oil because it doesn't represent Messiah and his kingdom. So you had fine flour, unleavened fine flour, right? Unleavened wheat flour, olive oil being mashak, being anointed by the ruach, and frankincense that represents a glorious smell and aroma to go up in the fire that God, can you imagine God having something like nostrils receiving a beautiful, pure aroma? We know that in um, the book of Revelation, there is a temple in heaven. Do not be deceived. The temple in heaven, the temple on the earth was to be replicated as close as possible to the temple in heaven. And so the unleavened, the grain offering of the unleavened, that's you, and ultimately, of course, Yeshua, mashacht, anointed by the Holy Ghost, that's us, and the frankincense is a heavy, wonderful smell that just has a beautiful odor of glory, and just like our prayers are that incense, and so we are the uh, uh, fine, unleavened father, as Yeshua was and is to the father, so the bride is to be, so let's talk about this unleavened wheat. Let's go to the gospel of Matthew 13. Let's talk about this for just a second. It says here that, let's see. It says that the Messiah put forth this saying, and this is the parable. And a parable, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, I need a drink of water, excuse me. A parable is a story that is telling a very profound truth. So our Messiah tells this parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, wait one second, wait, wait, yeah, like unto a man. And it says that, uh, that when he sowed good seed in the field, while the men slept, the enemy came, sowed tares among the wheat. There's your, un, there's your, your, your unleavened 
flower that's you and me and then he went his way and then it says but when the grass was sprung up and brought forth fruit then it appeared the tares were with it also so the servants of the household came and said sir did you not just sow good seed in the field so where did these tares come from and then of course the householder says which is messiah he says an enemy's done this the servant said to him well thou then we go and gather and just pull them all up. But the master says, no, because while you go gather the tares, you're going to root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Wow. And in the time of harvest, I will then say to the reapers, gather you first the tares, not the wheat. Bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Of course, his barn represents his kingdom. And so he is saying clearly right here in this parable, he's saying that the tares and the wheat, that we will be walking amongst wicked people who have no thought for God, for sanctifying his name, for obeying him, for communing with him, for anything of the nature, we are going to grow up together with these tares. But in the end, and, and most of you do know who are farmers, I'm sure, things like this, um, that the 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 wheat and the tares they actually look alike and you can't tell until the fruit will determine which one it is well how true is that and god speaks about the fruit very very clearly just a few chapters earlier when he says that every tree that a good tree can't bring forth evil fruit a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit so every tree that it does not bring forth good fruit is cast down and cast into the fire therefore by their fruits you shall know them and then he amazingly goes into and says and of course he's talking about the day and age in which we live not everyone that says lord lord is going to enter into the kingdom but he that does the will of my father which is in heaven for multitudes will say to me lord lord we prophesied and in your name, the devil's left. And in your name, many miracles. Then I will profess to them, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you that work without the law of God. So that means a lawless person who does all kinds of fancy acrobats in a church service or in a stadium or wherever they are, if they do not love the law of God and they work iniquity, anomia, uh, Torahlessness, it's all the same thing. It says it's not done by the pure Ruach HaKodesh. And then we see in uh, the final apocalyptic book of Revelation in chapter 14, we see the finale of the wheat harvest here because it clearly says here, and I look, this is a Revelation 14, behold, a white cloud. Lavan Anan, Lavan Anan is how we say that. Upon the cloud, one sat as the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who's sitting on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle, reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's us. That's the last days. He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he also had a sharp uh, sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, which had power uh, over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had his sharp sickle for the harvest saying, thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe and the angel thrust in the sickle and gathered the vine of the earth that's grapes cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of god so here we have we call parallelism god is clearly saying um, that there is a wine press of the wrath of god for those who know not his son who are not atoned who care less about his word he says that they will be cast into the wine press but of course grapes grapes represent the harvest of the righteous also and the same with the wheat the wheat and the tares we have the the the, the contrast not the parallel but the contrast of the wheat and the tares and so so much of the time um if you think about your life um like even at the last supper 
<laughs> think about this. When Yeshua took the matzah and he says, take this and eat, this is my body. Well, it's no coincidence here that he was born in Beit Lechem, house of bread. It's no coincidence, he says in John 6, that he is the bread of life that came down from heaven. It's no coincidence, he says, I'm the everlasting bread of life. And, you know, there is something interesting, and I'm going to go off, off cue a little bit here. But, you know, when Yeshua, when he was given his pajana bin by his mother, Mary uh, and his earthly father who raised him there for a few years. The, you know, when Simeon said, my eyes have seen now Yeshua, the light to light Gentiles, the glory of Israel, that was the menorah. Menorah was gleaming in the, in the background, the light to light in all the Gentiles. The Gentiles would be partakers of Israel's covenants of the menorah, Yeshua being the light of the world. But you know what else too? The menorah was illuminating the table of showbread. The table of showbread had six, six loaves on one side, six loaves on the other side, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel, which is their office, as you can see in the book of Revelation, with the sealing of the 12,000 from the 12 tribes, 144,000 being the final witnesses of the Messiah to bring the gospel. They are the final Billy Graham evangelist, so to speak, to the whole world. The 144,000, the, the governmental number of 12,000 is going to reach this whole planet before it's all over. Well, how amazing is that? And so God was saying, even back then, at Yeshua's dedication with those 12 loaves on the table of showbread, he was saying Israel will be the propagators of the gospel, but also he, they will propagate the gospel. But he's also was saying, that the menorah that light in the holy place, the table, the showbread, the menorah, right? The altar of incense, those, those articles represent uh, God in his uh, beauty and his fullness and his holiness. But lighting the table, the showbread, that was a, a picture, a symbol, so to speak, of the Messiah as the everlasting bread that came down from heaven. Moses did not give you that everlasting bread. My father gives you. You don't have to say, what is this? Who is this? He is the everlasting bread. When they did say who and what is Yeshua was not his father a carpenter and his mother Mary, but but we don't have to say that because when we know the word, we know exactly who he is. I'm made to that. And so when Yeshua took that matzah and said, you know, this is my body. This is, I am the bread. He was clearly saying as the menorah, I am the Shem and Hamoshiach. I am the oil of God, the Messiah. And so just like the fine wheat flour that makes up the grain offering with the pure olive oil, with the frankincense that gives it a beautiful, sweet aroma. Did you know <clears throat> in this book, it also says that, um, that no, it has to be unleavened bread, but no honey can be used as an offering. As you might say, well, wait a second. Uh, God speaks of the honey as the eternal word. Thy word is unto me, uh, the joy and rejoicing is honey sweeter uh, to my mouth. And in Psalms 19, it's sweeter than the honeycomb. Yes, it has that symbolism, but honey, if you put it on the altar, and not only does it uh, um, make the sacrifices, it elongates the time for the sacrifices to be consumed, but it makes a bad odor. And again, could God have nostrils? I say it, he must because he forbid honey as part of the sacrifices. It has to be a sweet sacrificial aroma in his nostrils. So isn't that very interesting that God um, could smell? That is a very, very interesting thought for all of us, truly. Um, you know, uh, the next offering, a lot of people don't understand this one is called the peace offering. These are peace offerings. And you know, Yeshua, he is our peace that has made us together one. I want to read that uh, to you. And let's see, let's go to my King Jameis, excuse me here. But now in Messiah, you who were sometimes you were far off. He's talking about all the Gentiles 
who clearly write the scripture right before that, you're saying that at that time you were Gentiles, uncircumcised, you were without Messiah and alien from the commonwealth of Israel. You are the commonwealth. You are, you are drinking from the sap and the covenants of the nation. You were a stranger from the covenants of promise. You had no hope. You were without God in the world, but now you who were far off are brought nigh by the blood for he is our peace. He is our shalamim, shalamim. He is our shalamim, our peace offering who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us having nullified in his flesh the enemy and he has made one new man so making peace between us that he might reconcile both that's jew and gentile unto god in one body by the execution stake having slain the enemy thereby the enemy is our sin of course and so as yeshua being the shalomim the peace offering um he's also called the prince of peace in isaiah 9 6 and this child who shall be born is wonderful counselor, mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting father. Uh, there he is. And then when you read in Romans, excuse me, uh, Revelation chapter one, verse five, it clearly says, and from Messiah, who is the faithful witness, that means he was the prophet who spoke the exact word of God. He is the first begotten of the dead. He is, uh, he's referring to himself as the first fruits that rise from the dead. And it says that he's the prince of the kings of all the earth. How there is his name again. That name in Hebrew is the word Sar. And so a lot of people uh, understand Pesach to be kind of a sin offering, but it's, it's really a peace offering because the peace offering itself uh, was shared it was shared uh, first with God. God had the choicest piece, of course, on the altar. And then the high priest had the next choicest piece. And then, of course, it was shared with men. And this offering represents covenant, covenantal relationship with men and with God. And then the fourth offering is called the Asham. That's a transgressions against God. That's things that we do are totally humiliating and shameful against God. So uh, it, it, possibly intentional sins, not unintentional and intentional. We need to make things right with God and we need to make things right with our brothers. Matthew 5, 23. Let me take you here. 523 it says here that therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother has ought against you leave your gift before the altar go your way be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift and agree with the adversary quickly while you're still in the way lest at any time this adversary deliver you to the judge the judge deliver you to the officer and now you're in prison and now you're in no means going to come out of there till you've paid the utmost in price. So it's good to come clean with God, good to come clean with people. It's good, you know, maybe there's people that are, are long gone and you can't say you're sorry or whatever that is. But in your heart, if you can't go to them personally, of course, in your heart, you just for sure, just give it to God and you have no malice in your heart to anybody in your life. It's very important because life is full of offenses. Life is full of um, transgressions, offenses. Uh, we have to just be extremely careful that we never add God to the equation because he's perfect and he's perfect in all of our ways and whatever he allows in our life or doesn't allow in our life. If he allows a lot of enemies and a lot of offenses, we have to thrust them off uh, from us very quickly so we don't have to pay according to this word pay the uttermost uh, in, in amount. And so that's very, very important. That's called the Asham offering. And the Azazel is called the goat of departure. This goat uh, carries and bears all the sins of all the people. Uh, now, it is uh, many times that the goat was thrown over the cliff uh, and, you know, to, to, to represent God taking bearing our sins and taking them away completely. Uh, but many times it just went out into the wilderness uh, to be very, very thirsty and just to survive. 
and the fit man would come back. And this Azazel uh, represents, of course, the Messiah. Uh, the, the Messiah has many, many, many different names uh, for all of the titles and all of the functions of the Messiah. But it's even his name uh, of Messiah is actually in the English, Az Az L. That's uh, very, very interesting. That, that represents him and his feminine quality and his masculine quality as E-L. El always is a word that represents God. If you put Elohim, then you have the masculine of, of the, uh, the Hebrew. Uh, if you have Ot, O-T-E, then that is representing female. Just like I started at the beginning, carbonot, the offerings, the sacrifices are, are feminine. They're oat, they're not in, they're carbon oat, to come near, to come near. Israel, Zion, that also has a femininity to it also. And so the uh, last uh, offering is called the kata'a, that is the sin offering. And that is where um, it's for sins and ignorance. It's also, if you have violated an oath before the Lord, uh, you need to be covered for that. Um, the purpose of the sin offering uh, is for all of Israel, for all the kings, for the high, all the sins of the high priest, for everyone who has sinned. The purpose of the kata'a offering was um, after you have made teshuva. Now, listen carefully. Teshuva means to return. Now, um, you don't return to your own ways. You return to the truth. After you have made repentance, uh, teshuva means you are, you are repenting of your evil. But in your repentance and your confession, you're not just going to go back to your old ways. You, to, the meaning of teshuva is to return to the truth of God, to return to righteousness, which would be to return to the word, the Torah word. And so after you have repented, then you, you prepare to receive forgiveness on, on the part of God uh, who will renew renewal of your covenant. It, it doesn't mean that, that you've lost your covenant as much as it means that it's communion back with God because sin will always separate you from God. Now, this offering was always offered um, and private, it was personal uh, pro, uh, um, sacrifices between you and the high priest on a, the appointed feast and different times. But on the day of atonement, that was a public, it was a public display for all of Israel. And of course, we know that the high priest went into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the most holy place to, to uh, bear the sins for the high priest and for all the citizens of Israel. Hebrews 10, 5 and Seven, I want to read you to substantiate uh, what I'm speaking of here. Okay. Okay, it says, uh, in all of those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again that's made of sins every year meaning that annually every person who was a part of the covenant, whether they were born DNA Hebrew Jewish people, or they were righteous Gentiles, God fearers and, and knew and loved the one true living God, they also would make sacrifices. It says, but those sacrifices, you have to return every year uh, because there's a remembrance of those sins. Then it says, for it is not possible that the blood of goats and of bulls should ever take away sins. And then I love this part, wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering, you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. For in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, and this is a Messiah speaking, lo, I come in the volume of the Torah, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and burnt offerings for sin, you would not, neither did you take pleasure, which are offered by the Torah. Then he said, lo, I come to do your will. And it, this means he is taking away the sacrificial ritual that he, that he may establish the second. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, you will hear uh, many Protestant ministers who will make a butchery of the scripture. Because in the King James, it says, 
Then he said, lo, I come to do your will. He take this is King James. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the, the, the covenant being taken away. He's talking about the sacrificial ritual system when the temple still stood and when you had to go annually to the temple. But we know that once Yeshua as the sacrificial lamb offered it, he did it once and for all as a final offering. And so this is a little bit of food for thought for you here is uh, although Messiah, his final sacrifice for all sins, remember when he prophesied and he said about the uh, stones, not one stone will still remain. And of course they were shocked his disciples, like they're thinking how in the world can this big gold silver temple, how can not one stone be on another? But nonetheless, that was obviously the case. But even after his death and his resurrection, Messiah, it says for 40 years, the temple stood and the, sacrifice, the sacrifices were offered and brought to the high priest for those 40 years. And so it's a testimony. It's a testimony. Then, of course, when Herod and the, and the destruction of the temple, that was all done. But it still stood as a testimony for the horrendous, how horrendous it is to sin against a holy God. So the train of thought, spiritual logic would say that although the Yeshua, who is the perfect Passover lamb, even though uh, there is no temple and the, the, that the cessation of the priesthood was inaugurated uh, when Yeshua you know, when, when he when he went and was resurrected, it was still 40 years. Uh, you have to wonder, and I've been asked this several times. Well, um, I, I, you know, it's hard for them to believe that when Yeshua returns, the anti Messiah is not far off of coming to desecrate uh, the temple, the altar, and of course, the Holy of Holies. And this is, of course, when Yeshua returns. This is when he takes his seat in his throne and he builds very quickly his own temple. And so you might be shocked to hear this, but the major and minor prophets all spoke about reinstating the same sacrifices in Messiah's kingdom when he returns. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why, but I first want you to hear it for yourself. So you will well, hear it. You just need to hear it because nobody ever preaches or teaches on this. For the life of me, I do not know why, but they don't. But I'm going to tell you why it's important. But I first want to read you Isaiah. Isaiah saw more of the kingdom of Messiah and the new heavens and the new earth than any other prophet. But he also spoke about the millennial kingdom and he talked about the position that Gentiles who are not Jewish, who are going to have in the millennial kingdom based on this chapter. I want to read it to you. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and judgment for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on it that will keep my Shabbat from polluting it and will keep his hand from doing any evil. And then he says, and this is Isaiah, by, by the word of God, neither let the son of the Gentile that has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord has utterly se separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, that will keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and will take hold of my covenant. To them will I give in my house. Now he's talking about the millennial temple and within my walls, a place, a name better than all sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. It will not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love his name, to be his servants. Everyone, again, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, takes hold of my covenant. To those will I bring to my holy mountain. I And mountain is the temple. It, whenever you see it in, in the prophets, the mountain always is the temple. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. His house of prayer is the temple. And there, oh, here we go. Listen, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices talk about the Gentiles now, shall be accepted upon my altar. 
for my temple shall be called the house of prayer for all people. Now you maybe have never heard that scripture. And then, then, then is, this is even more amazing. The Lord God, which gathers all the outcasts of Israel. Whenever you read outcasts of Israel, those are the 10 lost tribes for 2,700 years that have been separated from the house of Judah. That's who they are. They're all coming home. They're making Aliyah. They're going to Israel. But God refers to them uh, scripturally as outcasts of Israel. He says, I will gather others to Israel but though besides those that are already gathered to him well that's Israel Israel's already gathered but he says he's going to gather all the Gentiles and the outcasts together but he clearly says that these righteous Gentiles in their life well he will make them joyful and he says that their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar so there you have it there you have it and then as uh, Zechariah the prophet he amazingly ends his book with the same thing. He says this when Zechariah, Zechariah is all about the last days and the final battle of Armageddon and all that goes on and keeping the Feast of Tabernacles or the Gentiles will do it in his kingdom. And then he says this in that day, there shall be even on the bells of the horses, holiness to the Lord and all the pots in the Lord's house. That sounds like a kitchen statement shall be like the bowls before the altar, the bowls before the altar. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Every pot in Jerusalem and in Ju and Judah will be holiness to the Lord and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and cook therein in the day. There shall no more be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. My, my. And then we have uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 40. Now, Ezekiel 40 through 48. The whole thing. Oh, my goodness. He goes into the greatest length, greatest detail of the magnitude, magnificence of the fourth temple that, that Yeshua is going to build. It dwarfs every other temple in every other way in size and in detail. It, it, it describes the altar of the Lord where the sacrifices will be put, but the, 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 it's the Zadok priesthood that is going to do the ministering and do the car carbon the, the drawing near because they were the ones that were faithful to the almighty they were the ones when moses said who's on the lord's side and they all came close to that zadok priesthood so guess what if god remembers what they did way back then with moses on the mountain and he's going to reinstitute this fourth temple and this sacrificial system with the Zadok priesthood because they were righteous because they stood with Moses because they did not offend the Lord because they drew near and they taught others how to perfectly draw near to God then guess what your stewardship and your life your very 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 short life down here he's going to remember you also because remember, Rabbi Paul, when he ends his epistles, what does he say? He says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. He doesn't just say grow in the grace of God. He always says grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? It's <laughs> and you can't understand Yeshua's words without three fourths of the Bible on the left. You can't understand Rabbi Paul talking about putting your body on an altar unless you read Leviticus. Do you know that Leviticus in the book of Leviticus, every seventh letter, now seven is the number. For all of you Bible scholars in the apocalyptic book of Revelation, we've got seven bowls, we've got seven trumpets, everything is seven, seven, seven. Well, seven is a big number. And, you know, uh, in the kingdom, in the kingdom, who and what you did and where you are here and now, without question, will put you in the celestial realm. Do you know that I just saw a picture early this morning of a war, somebody, um, some artist drew a picture of a big, big globe it represented either the earth or the world or the cosmos. I don't know, but it had four tzitzit on it and it had all these hands grappling to, to touch the tzitzit because the prophet Zechariah said what? 
He says, in that day, that's a Messianic kingdom millennial statement, whenever you see Bayom, Bayom, in that day, it says the 10 from all the nations will grab the tzitzit of him that is a Yehudi and say, we will go with you. If we know God is with you, you will teach us about God. Because in the end, the Jewish people in the nation of Israel will be the chief among the nations. And it says right there in the scripture, three times in the book of Numbers, uh, in the book of Habakkuk, and I forget what the third reference is, but it says, for as surely as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the knowledge of God, because the knowledge of God is glory. And so the sevens that are spoken of in both covenants, you know, both covenants, one scroll, God is always saying the same thing, expanding the thought, uh, just like animal sacrifices were never to remove sin, only that's a reminder of your sin. That's why you have to come back every year. And so in the millennium, the animal sacrifice will also not take away sin because the lamb is the final atonement. But we will also see when people bring these sacrifices of the unleavened bread, when they put the, the, the high priestly anointing oil on the flour and all in the frankincense, we will see how all of it foreshadowed Messiah's character, his nature, his attributes. It will serve as a physical demonstration that sin brings death and it will give great glory to God, to the ultimate sacrifice of Yeshua being, being the lamb. And so we are to grow in the grace, but know of an assurity that even though uh, Yeshua is the, the, the perfect eternal sacrificial lamb, the fact that God clearly says all throughout these prophets, he says it in Jeremiah, Zechariah, Isaiah, that he's going to institute that again, and he is going to accept from the Gentiles, but they're going to get better names than sons and daughters because of their great obedience and because they feared God and did and did what the word told them to do. And so the knowledge of God is is glorious and we have faith in God and, and it pleases God without faith. It is impossible to please God, but know that your faith, your faith, you have faith to produce obedience. You have the mashak, you have the anointing of the spirit of God to obey God. It, it, all of the scriptures teach that. And, be, and because, because as I was stating, I'm going to go back to it because I think the Lord wants to end this way. I, uh, I, I didn't say it a few minutes ago, but now he's going to say it through me. In the book of Leviticus, every seventh letter, every seventh letter in the entire book spells yud Hey vav Hey, Because yud Hey vav Hey is the glorious name the covenantal name of almighty god um you can many say yahweh many could say yahuwah uh, many say yahoshua yahoshua you could say a yahovah which is what i say yahovah because yahoshua is the name that he comes in his father's name yahoshua comes in the name of Yehovah. It has the same, same um, sound phonetically to it. And so every seven letters is the holy name of God because this is the book of holiness, Kadusha. Kadusha is the word for holiness. So yes, you might be ransomed by the blood of the lamb. Yes, your name might be in the lamb's book of life. But if you want to walk a life of Kedusha, then there's things that you do. There's obedience that you have, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, it doesn't matter. But not only does it please the Lord, but it, in his kingdom, you have great placement. You have great placement with him. So Father, in the name of Yeshua, I thank and I praise you that, that your secret codes of every seven letters is your most holy name, Father. That children... In Jewish homes, Father, are called and to memorize the book of Leviticus. From five years old, they're to memorize it, Lord, because it speaks of who you are. And the Torah leads a person to your eternal son. If a person studies the Torah, they can't miss every jot and tittle, Father, 
is who you are and the giving of your son and the glorious unleavened sacrifices of the fine flower, Lord, and whom Yeshua is. But Lord, as his bride, Yeshua wants his bride to be unleavened as him, to be mashaped with the holy oil and to offer up a savor of a glorious odor unto you, Lord. So Father, in all of these offerings, Lord, we could speak of them till the kingdom comes. But Lord, when your kingdom comes, you are going to sit on David's throne and the Zadok priesthood is going to minister because they were worthy servants, Lord, to minister at your altar for the Gentiles who will receive a name better than the sons and daughters in your millennial kingdom. That's what your word says. I thank you for speaking through your minor and your major prophets, Lord, these amazing truths, Lord, that are so uh, glossed over, Father, but they're so important to you. Thank you for, for, for uh, revealing to Ezekiel of all the prophets, Lord, the magnitude and magnificence of what you're going to build when you sit on David's throne, Lord. We look forward to your kingdom coming when you sit with that scepter and the Torah goes forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem from henceforth and even forevermore. Thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen.